So we've been doing our series called Entrusted over the last couple of weeks, and um, we've been building on the fact that lack is the root of every temptation, that if you have this deep feeling or sense of lack deep within you, then you are going to be led into temptation because you believe that there is a need that you need to fulfill in your own strength. And that through Jesus Christ, he has come and he has given us righteousness, which is what God intended for you and I to feel. It, it doesn't help that we just have doctrine, but we're not experiencing what God wants us to experience. When God says that he loves you, he wants you to feel what it is to be loved of God. When God says that there is no condemnation for you, he wants you to feel what it feels like to be innocent, to live without shame and guilt and condemnation, to live without this feeling that I'm never gonna be good enough. See, and God gave us the gift of righteousness so that we could feel what it feels like to be a part of the Godhead, where there is presence and power and purpose, and there's peace and there's joy. These are the expressions of what it is to be one with God. And that's God's gift to you in his son, Jesus Christ. So if I'm feeling any kind of lack, if I'm feeling that somebody isn't meeting my needs or my employer isn't meeting my needs or this situation or this town or whatever it might be, the government, we always wanna put it on something. We're looking for something else to meet our needs instead of recognizing that Christ in me is all that I need. And when I'm conscious of that, when my mindset and my believing is connected to my identity as a son of God, then I live out of that place where I'm not trying to get people to meet needs. You see, and that's a disaster. Ask anyone who's been married for longer than two weeks. <laughs> You're trying to get somebody to meet your needs. It doesn't work. Prosperity is something that Jesus died for you to walk in. In Galatians 3, it says you've been redeemed from the curse of the law. And the curse of the law, as we've seen, is poverty, sickness, and spiritual death. Jesus died and he took that on so that you could walk in what you've been redeemed into. What is the opposite of poverty? Abundance, prosperity. You've been redeemed from sickness. What is the opposite of sickness? Health. God wants you to walk in health. And spiritual death. He wants you to walk in newness of life. So if Jesus died for you to receive this, then it's worth persuading our hearts of. It's worth pursuing. It's worth saying, Father, I thank you for the gift of Jesus, that because I have you in me, I can walk in your destiny for me, which is blessing, health, wholeness. We've got to move from this place of just having our needs met into a place of abundance. Because in Galatians 3, it says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon you. And the blessing that God blessed Abraham with was, I'm going to bless you to be a blessing. And he blessed Abraham so much that he was a blessing to nations. That's serious wealth. And God wants you to walk in this place of abundance so that you can be a blessing. Amen. So Isaiah 48 verse 17, it says it this way. This is what the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel says. I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit or benefit, who leads you in the way that you should go. God, when you walk with God, he will teach you how to profit. Profit is better than a loss. Okay, I'm not a good accountant, but I do know a profit is better than a loss. Credit is better than debit. And the Bible says that God will teach you how to make a profit. One amen there. So in Deuteronomy 8, this was from the beginning of time, this was the promise that God gave to the children of Israel. He says that when I bless you, just remember that it's me. But when I do it, I also want you to recognize that it's my grace in you that is gonna lead you to create wealth. Let's read that. Otherwise you may say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. But you shall remember with profound respect the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth. And that word power there is connected to the word grace, which is his ability. We're saying that he will give you grace to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore and solemnly promised to your fathers as it is to this day. So God wants you to prosper so that his kingdom can be advanced. Amen. And don't say to me, but I'm just a public servant. Or I'm just a whatever. 
See, we, we want to connect our provision to our employer. No, God can give you creative ideas where you can still be a whatever and still have ideas to create wealth. Don't limit God. Don't limit yourself. Step into this place where you're saying, Father, I'm open to you teaching me how to profit. Amen. So this morning, if you're a guest with us, I'm sorry, because I'm going to be talking about giving once a year. We do, we, every now and then, we, we, we hardly ever talk about giving. So you just happen to choose the morning where I'm going to be talking about giving. So maybe God brought you here for a reason. <laughs> But you know, it's funny, whenever we talk about money in church, people get very um, uncomfortable. So just get comfortable. This is for sons and daughters who understand the kingdom. Okay. Everyone just smile at me so you know I'm not talking to you. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about giving this morning. The first thing about giving is our motivation for giving. What is our motivation for giving? Why do we give? Why do we live generously? And the Bible says that the only motivation for our giving has to be love. Has to be love. In 1 Corinthians 13, 3, it says, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, if I surrender my body to be burned, but I don't have love, it profits me nothing. So no matter what I do with, it, with regards to my giving, it has to be connected to love. If I believe that I'm giving to get something, that's not love. So my giving has to be, well, let's describe what is love. What is he talking about here in 1 Corinthians 13? He's talking about unconditional love. He's talking about a love that is self-sacrificial, a love that is connected to the value of somebody else, not myself, a love that has prescribed value on somebody else. So my, love, my giving has to be connected to me ascribing value on something else, not connected to how is it going to benefit me. Does it benefit me? Yes, it does. But that can't be my motivation. My motivation has to be God's love working in and through me. Jesus said it this way in Acts 20, 35. In everything I've pointed out to you by example, that by working diligently in this manner, we ought to assist the weak, being mindful of the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed, it makes one happier and more to be envied to give than to receive. Those are the words of the Lord Jesus. He says it's going to make you happier when you're living a life giving than receiving. Those are his words. Amen. So giving is a manifestation of my trust in God. It's an expression of who I am as a son and daughter of God. So the Bible talks about honoring God through our first fruits. So when I'm giving when God has given me something and I respond in giving, the Bible says that that honors God in Proverbs 3, 9. So where do we give? And this is not in any particular order, okay? So I'm just gonna read scriptures about giving in the New Testament. So where do I give? Well, number one, I'm not saying firstly, I'm just saying number one, okay? Just smile at me. <laughs> tell, them, tell your neighbor, this, it's gonna be okay, we're gonna get through this. So the first place, okay, not first place, number one, <laughs> give to your local church. First Corinthians 9, I'm reading out the Passion Translation. Who serves in the military at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not enjoy the grapes for himself? Who would nurture and shepherd a flock and never get to drink its fresh milk? Am I merely giving you my own opinions or does the Torah teach the same things? For it is written in the law of Moses, you should... Never put a muzzle over the mouth of an ox while he's treading out the grain. Tell me, is God only talking about oxen here? Doesn't he also give us this principle so that we won't withhold support from his workers? It was written so that we would understand that the one spiritually plowing and spiritually treading out the grain also labors with the expectation of enjoying the harvest. So if we've sowed many spiritual gifts among you, is it too much to expect to reap material gifts from you? And if you have supported others, don't we rightfully deserve this privilege even more? But as you know, we haven't used that right. Instead, we have continued to support ourselves so that we would never be a hindrance to the spread of the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that the priests employed in sacred duty in the temple are provided for by temple resources? 
and the priests who serve at the altar receive a portion of the offerings. In the same way, the Lord has directed those who proclaim the gospel. Who directed this? Okay, I just want to make that clear. In the same way, the Lord has directed those who proclaim the gospel to receive their living by the gospel. As for me, I prefer to never use any of these rights for myself. And keep in mind that I'm not writing all of this because I'm hinting that you should support me. I'm just reading the scriptures, okay? <laughs> but notice there is a cor correlation here. He's saying if you are receiving spiritual gifts, if your life is being impacted, so let's make it personal. If you come to Nisna Vineyard and you're experiencing life and you're enjoying what God is doing in you, he's saying then you need to show that support through your giving. There is a connection to me sowing, or not me, our team, who we are, sowing spiritual gifts, and then there is a reaping, materially, so that we can feed 630 kids with fed cook and mince and juices and give them prizes and seeing their lives impacted for eternity. What price do we put on that? But he's saying that there is a connection here, that you've got to be giving so that we can make that happen. And there's times when our bank account, our church bank account is down to like a thousand rand because we take the money to go and invest it in people. We don't burden you with that, but I'm just letting you know. It would make life so much easier if everybody just did their part. Amen. Amen. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. I like this scripture. The pastors who lead the church well should be paid well. <laughs> hey. And everybody said, Amen. Yeah. Amen. Listen to this, it carries on. <laughs> they should receive double honor for faithfully preaching and teaching the revelation of the Word of God. For the scriptures have taught us do not muzzle an ox or forbid it to eat while it grinds the grain. And also, the one who labors deserves his wages. Amen. So don't call me an ox, <laughs> unless you're going to put money in my bank account. <laughs> then you can call me whatever you want. So this is just a scriptural principle, that those who are in the ministry should reap materially from those whose lives are being benefited by the gospel. Amen. In Galatians 6, in the Amplified, it says it this way, let him who receives instruction in the word of God share all good things with his teacher, contributing to his support. Share all good things. Good things. Amen. So, it's what he's saying here in the scriptures. If you eat at Spur, you don't go and pay Wimpy. <laughs> Amen. If you're getting fed spiritually, you don't go and give your money somewhere else. He's saying be a part of what God is doing in the community you're a part of by contributing financially. Amen. Amen. Secondly, who else do we give to? We give to missionaries. We give to those who have been sent, those who are proclaiming the gospel outside of our church walls, those people who are spreading the gospel where we can never get to. So as a church, we support people who are in Latvia and Estonia, we, who, who live here in Niza, but go there and go and preach the gospel. We support um, a lady who's translating the Bible and has been doing for 35 years in the islands of, in the Camors. That's what she's been doing for 35 years, and this church has supported her for 35 years. And she's been translating the Bible into the local dialect. You know, we, we support YFC. We support people who are traveling into Zambia. We support mission work. Why? Because the Bible says that we must do this. So let's read a couple of scriptures concerning that. 3 John 1 to 8. I'm reading out the Amplified. The elderly elder of the church addresses this letter to the beloved esteemed Gaius, whom I truly love. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in every way and that your body may keep well even as I know your soul keeps well and prospers. What is God's desire for you? That you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. God wants you to walk in what Jesus died for. Verse three, in fact, I greatly rejoiced when some of the brethren from time to time arrived and spoke so highly of the sincerity and fidelity of your life as indeed you do live in the truth the whole gospel represents. I have no greater joy than this, to hear that my spiritual children 
are living their lives in the truth. Beloved, it is a fine and faithful work that you are doing when you give any service to the Christian brethren, and especially when they are strangers. They have testified before the church of your love and friendship. You will do well to forward them on their journey, and you will please do so in a way worthy of God's service. For these traveling missionaries have gone out for the namesake, for his sake, and are accepting nothing from the Gentiles, the heathen, and the non-Israelites. So we ourselves ought to support such people, to welcome and provide for them, in order that we may be fellow workers in the truth, the whole gospel, and cooperate with its teachers. So he's saying, man, if you, have, if you know of somebody who's a traveling missionary, support them financially. They need your support. Paul had people and churches that supported him. Jesus had people when he was traveling, who supported him. So let's look at some of those scriptures. Paul, he's talking to the Philippian church. And the Philippian church were a church that supported him financially on his missionary journeys. Verses 14. But it was right and commendable and noble of you to contribute for my needs and to share my difficulties with me. And you Philippians yourselves well know that in the early days of the gospel ministry, when I left Macedonia, no church or assembly entered into partnership with me and opened up a debit and credit account in giving and receiving except you only. So he's talking about a partnership that they begin to experience the benefits, the eternal benefits of as they partnered with Paul and he went and he started to plant churches and he began to share the gospel and lives began to change, they began to benefit of that. It was accredited to their account as much as it was to Paul. Verse 16, for even in Thessalonica, you sent me contributions for my needs, not only once, but a second time. Not that I seek or am eager for your gift, but I do seek and am eager for the fruit which increases to your credit. Notice what he's saying. Your giving, that fruit, helps me preach the gospel, but the fruit is accredited to you. Do you see that? The harvest of blessing that is accumulating to your account. Verse 18, but I have your full payment and more. I have, I have everything I need and am amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent me. They are the fragrant over odor of an offering and sacrifice which God welcomes and in which he delights. So when you give, the Bible says it's a fragrant odor to God and God delights in that because you're supporting somebody in preaching the gospel. And then he says, verse 19, and my God will liberally supply full to the full your every need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You know, oftentimes we, in a time of crisis and it's like, God, I need a need met. And we quote verse 19, my God shall supply all of my needs. But notice what it's connected to. It's connected to you partnering with somebody. It's connected to you sowing into the kingdom of God. Not that it's conditional, but for you to receive what God has for you, you've got to be activating your heart in a place where you can receive. And the way that you activate your heart to receive is by you taking a step of faith and giving. And that's what he's saying here. Now, Jesus also had people who supported him. Luke 8, verses 1 to 3. I'm reading out the New Living Translation. Soon afterward, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. He took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager. Good to have a business manager handling your finances. Susanna and many others who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. See, we don't, oftentimes don't think practically. We think that stuff just happens. And there's no practical aspect to it. So he's saying, yeah, even Jesus, as he traveled, they needed to eat. They needed to stay somebody. Hello? They didn't just walk and pick grapes as they were walking. There were a whole group of them, 12 men, needed eating. And they needed to be fed. And there was a whole bunch of women who were with them. And the Bible says that they were contributing out of their own support out of their own means to help Jesus go and spread the gospel. So we give, amen? amen, to spread the gospel. We give to our church because we experience in community and what God's doing in us. 
we give to those who are preaching the gospel outside of the church. And then thirdly, we give to the poor. Amen? amen. I didn't get an amen, so I was waiting for one. <laughs> now, Jesus said that the poor we're always going to have with us. So that's something that's never going to go away. We're always going to have poor people. And our job is to make sure that our hearts don't grow hard and cold toward those who are in need. You've got to always guard your heart because sometimes we can get so upset with trying to give two rand to the car guard. Because it's like, well, does he deserve this two rand? It doesn't matter if he deserves it or not. Be a blessing. Go and take a hundred rand and change it into two rand coins and keep it in your cubby hole so that you don't have to freak out when the oak wants his two bucks and you're thinking about whether, well, he, I was only in the shop for five minutes. Just be a blessing. That two rand is a blessing to him. Because at the end of the day, he can go and buy some bread and milk. If he goes and buys some dope, that's not your problem. Just be a blessing. Let's, let's read some scriptures. Proverbs 14, 31. Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker. But he who is generous to the needy honors him. You honor God when you're generous to the needy and the poor. Proverbs 21, 13. Whoever closes his ears to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. Proverbs 22, 9. Whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed for he shares his bread with the poor. Proverbs 31, it talks about the Proverbs 31 woman. It also says there that she opens her hand to the poor. Proverbs 14, 21, whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. Proverbs, must I carry on? Are you getting the point? Whoever gives to the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes will, not, will get many a curse. So just keep your heart guarded. Don't let your heart grow hard when you see people in need. Because that person is also made in the very image of God. And by you expressing kindness and mercy and love through generosity, it touches people's hearts. So give to the poor. Amen? Amen. Now, as a church, and don't make it just our responsibility as a church. Take on the responsibility for yourself too. We, you are the church. So we do, as a church, we give to those who are in need. But we have a a place of accountability where we take people's information, we go and see what's happening in their house, we give people food, we have a deep freeze, we help people, but it's not only our responsibility. Amen. So amen, amen. amen. Okay, thank you very much. So now the most important question, how much do we give? How much do you want to give? One person said to me, uh, uh, when we were talking about money and he was like, yeah, I'm going to go and pray about how much God wants me to give. I said, no, I wouldn't do that if I was you. <laughs> He's like, why not? I said, if you go and pray about it, God's going to tell you to give more. Yeah. <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken, the Colonel Sanders, a friend of mine, Jim Richards in the States, his um, lady who does all his media, her name is Angel, and um, she was in the same church as Colonel Sanders. And at 80 years old, she had a conversation with him. And he said to her that these were his words. Most people don't know that I've given away 90% of my income. The man who owned KFC. And he gave it to churches and missionaries. Colgate, the guy who invented Colgate, gave 90% of his income away. The guy who invented Caterpillar. Quaker Oats. I can tell you about many, many companies that were started by men and women who got together and decided we are going to start business for the kingdom of God. Guinness, you know the beer Guinness? It was started by nuns. <laughs> there was a problem in Ireland that they saw that the Irish loved drinking, but there were so many people who were malnourished that God spoke to some nuns and said, create a drink that is full of sustenance. Now, that freaks a whole bunch of religious people out. <laughs> you can trust God. 
But you know, many of these people, they didn't start, well, one day when I got millions, I'll give a 90% away. No, they started where they were, with 1% or 2% or 5%. 10%. Start where you're at. So let's read 2 Corinthians 9 and see what the scriptures say about this. Here's my point. I'm reading the Passion. A stingy sower will reap a meager harvest, but the one who sows from a generous spirit will reap an abundant harvest. Let giving flow from your heart, not from a sense of religious duty. Let it spring up freely from the joy of giving, all because God loves hilarious generosity. I've met some guys and women who actually there is such joy in their giving that they actually delight in giving. It's not a, like it says here, um, a religious duty. It's actually, they, there's like a grace that comes alive in them and it's like there's a joy connected to their giving. It says here, God loves hilarious generosity. Verse eight, yes, God is more than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace. So he's talking about grace giving. He's talking about a giving that is connected to the grace of God, not obligation, not have to, but because the grace is God's ability in you. So that you'll have more than enough of everything, every moment and in every way. He will make you overflow with abundance in every good thing you do just as the scriptures say about the one who trusts in him. Because he has sown extravagantly and given to the poor, so you see it's two things, his kindness and generous deeds will never be forgotten. Verse 10, this generous God who supplies abundant seed for the farmer, which becomes bread for our meals, is even more extravagant toward you. First, he supplies every need plus more. So God wants you to have your needs met plus more where you have more than enough to sow. Then he multiplies the seed as you sow it so that the harvest of your generosity will grow. You will be abundantly enriched in every way as you give generously on every occasion. So he wants you to give generously, when? On every occasion. For when we take your gifts to those in need, it causes many to give thanks to God. So your giving, give thanks to, it gives thanks to God. This priestly ministry you are providing, so he's saying when you give, it's a priestly ministry. It's godly. Your giving is spiritual. It's not just material. This priestly ministry you are providing through your offering not only supplies what is lacking for God's people, it inspires an outpouring of praises and thanksgiving to God himself. That's interesting. That it actually, God provokes praise and thanksgiving in God. Verse 13, for as your extremely generous offering meets the approval of those in Jerusalem, it will cause them to give glory to God. So he was talking about Corinthians and for them giving to Jerusalem. All because of your loyal support and allegiance to the gospel of Christ, as well as your generous hearted partnership with them toward those in need. Because of this extraordinary grace, which God has lavished on you, They will affectionately remember you in their prayers. Praise God for his astonishing gift, which is far too great for words. So we give as we have purposed in our hearts. So what do you purpose in your heart? You don't give because of manipulation. You don't give to get blessed. Do we get blessed? Yes, we do, but that's not our motivation. We give because there is a partnership, a spiritual and material partnership partnership that happens we give because we've determined in our hearts that's what we're going to do because we want to we do it because of joy we do it because of thanksgiving we do it because we know that this is godly it's a priestly ministry it's a part of what we do as sons and daughters of God it's part of what we do as children of God it's part of what we do as as community it's a part of what we do to make a difference amen Bible says that your gifts make room for you when you're generous it makes room for you Amen. So we give because it's something that flows from our hearts, not because we're feeling pressured, not because we're feeling manipulated, and not because we, you know, there's many churches, they'll tell you that if you don't give, you're, cursing, you're putting a curse on yourself. Have you heard that scripture in Malachi 3? If you haven't heard of it, it says that your tithe, if you don't tithe, you are robbing God, and there will be a curse that comes upon you. 
Now, Jesus has redeemed us from the curse. And I know many people who are still walking in blessing who don't tithe. Our confidence is not in our tithing. Our confidence is in Jesus. Amen. And so tithing is a natural response because I believe his word, and we looked at it last week and the week before, that Abraham, when he received a message of faith, righteousness, that God is at peace with him, he gave a tithe. So I believe if we look at all of these, Jesus spoke to those, he said to the Pharisees, you tithe mint and you tithe these small little things, but you've forgotten about the greater things, which is justice and mercy. He says, these do and do the others. So tithing is a, something that will, if everybody tithe, every church would have more than enough to do what God has put on them to do. Amen. But it's not a law. It's not a pressure. It's not a have to. It's a we get to. We do it because it honors God. It helps lives ch get changed for eternity. And what price can we put on a man's soul? But it takes money for us to do that. And so that's why there is a partnership the Bible talks about. A partnership where if you're receiving a spiritual gift, if your life is being touched and changed, if you've been impacted by the life of your community and church where you're at, then express it through your giving. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Are you still okay? Yes. All right. We don't do this all the time. But it's good to hear it. It's good to be reminded of this. It's good to recognize, listen, you are partnering with something that is changing this town. Amen. So know your giving. Do you want to know a practical thing? This church. We are audited, okay? I don't release payments. I can't. I'm just giving you practical things here. We have somebody else, another team that handle the finances. Everything that we pay for is requisitioned and signed by two people. So they, we have high accountability here. So this thing about the pastor getting double, <laughs> I can't pay myself double. <laughs> this is just a joke, okay? But it is true because I don't release payments. So we have high accountability with regards to money because the Bible says that we need to be good stewards and we need to be faithful amen so that's what we do and next week i'm going to be talking about stewardship and how god rewards stewardship and how god rewards faithfulness and that when you begin to partner with god and believe god god rewards you when you take what you have and you make more of it and we'll look at that next week now god gave people different talents and then he took those who didn't use their talents who were codependent Hello? And who didn't do anything with what they had. And he takes what they had and he gives it to the guy who has 10. That doesn't sound like true democracy to me. <laughs> Give to those who are producing fruit and take away from those who aren't. And so we'll learn about that next week and you'll be blessed by it because it'll expand your heart to say, Lord, thank you for God-given ideas that we can create wealth and I can receive and walk in that blessing and be a blessing to many. Amen.